It was my turn to make the speech. Even though I'd been on the debate team for years, had spoken in front of many audiences, this time I was scared. Staring at the thirty or so people around me, I cleared my throat. This wasn't some silly little opinion piece about ecological rights or which political party has the better position. Those would be easy topics. No, this would be as difficult as every time I was called to the vice principal's office. In case you didn't know, they are usually in charge of school discipline. Back in middle school and high school, I got to know them pretty good. That's not a good thing. I stood before these people, hoping the tremble in my knees didn't show or my voice didn't warble. I had to remain professional, at least as much as I could. I didn't know most of these people. All eyes focused on me. My stomach did backflips. Good thing I hadn't eaten anything this morning. I looked at my note cards, reading the first line I had planned to say. It seemed so stale now. I can't use this. Setting the cards down, I took a deep breath. I had each word on those cards memorized, but those words no longer seemed appropriate. They seemed stupid. The emotions must be real. This time, what I said had to be from the heart. This time, it was personal. Time to go off script and make a fool of myself. I cleared my throat again, suddenly nervous. I'm never nervous, but I am right now. My knee actually began to shake. The clock on the back wall clicked the time. God, the second hand moved so slow. And I began speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Most of you don't know me, but I'm Emmanuel Todd. My friends call me Red. In case you can't see my hair, I'm a ginger. That's why the nickname. Ten years ago, when I was twelve, I first met Paul. Because of him, I got into my first real fight. My family lived in Newport, Rhode Island, and I was in the junior boxing league, lightweight division. I was a scrawny, short kid in middle school. I guess not much has changed. A new kid had transferred in. Didn't know much about him, except he was from Vegas, and his parents were going through a divorce. His name was Paul Castillas, but we called him Vegas, and he always seemed sad. I invited him over to have lunch with me and my friends, and we had fun. He was pretty cool. He was living with his mom and grandparents while they fought over custody, property vision, child support, the usual. Paul's dad was rich and lived in Vegas, and his mom had cheated with her pool boy toy. It was a nasty battle. Dad got to keep the house in Vegas. Mom got to keep her boy toy and won primary custody over Paul. Anyway, there were these three guys in middle school. They thought they were tough. One day, Paul's dad sent him a real nice phone, and the bullies decided to play keep away, with Paul as the victim. When I got involved, they thought they could play keep away from both of us. They didn't like it when I punched one of the guys in the ribs. They thought they could gang up on me. They were stupid. None of those guys knew how to fight, so I beat them in ten seconds. One guy had a broken nose, one guy had a seriously black eye, and the other guy ran for the principal, crying. I wasn't punished because the security camera caught everything. I was given a severe warning about fighting. Paul's mom changed his middle school because our school was too violent. I was disappointed. I liked Paul, but whatever. The thing is, all the middle schools fed into one high school. That will become important later. Four years later, I was 16, a junior in high school. Mom was driving me crazy. So I took every chance to get out of the house, like practicing with a debate club. If school had any kind of a sports thing happening, I was there. Swim meet, football game, track and field, prom, any random dance. And if there wasn't a school thing going on, I went to the library or coffee shop or a friend's house or the gym. I suspected that I viewed life a bit different than my friends did. They looked at the girls and made the usual teenage comments. I looked at the guys and kept my comments to myself. It was in October of my junior year when I got the shock of my life. Friday night, there was a football game. 
I and my friends had gone. The opposing team had tackled our team's quarterback, hit him so badly that he had to be carried off the field in a stretcher. Rumors said he had broken ribs. A guy ran into the field to replace the quarterback. The back of his jersey said Castillas. Because of the helmet, I couldn't see who it was, but something in my gut suspected. He finished the game, and because of him, we won. After the game, with his helmet off, I finally got a look at him. Older, more athletic, it was Paul. I occasionally saw him around school, but he was surrounded by the cheerleaders and popular kids. Definitely not my crowd. If he ever saw me, he didn't recognize me. After school, I hung out at an old boxing gym, lifting weights, doing cardio, and I got into a lot of fights, but mostly in the ring. Dad was proud, started calling me scrapper. Mom hated me boxing, hated me being independent, hated me getting a part-time job serving frozen yogurt. Senior year, Paul became the all-star quarterback. Because of him, we won the 4A championships. That year, me and my parents had one of those obligatory meetings with the counselors to talk about graduation requirements. Good news, my GPA was a B+. I was thrilled. Dad was ecstatic and promised me brand new boxing gloves. Bad news was that Mom took it as a sign from God that she was a bad mom because I wasn't a straight-A student. Worse news, I was short one art credit. Mom tried to micromanage my life and made Dad's life hell. We learned later that she was having an affair and she thought if she could force Dad out, she'd get the house. Mom also tried to banish me from the gym to force me to study more, tried to make me quit my job, and demanded I give up boxing. Our fight was legendary. I gave her the big finger, grabbed my stuff, and left the house. Only problem, I was still 17. The two times the police brought me back, I grabbed some more stuff and left the house minutes after the police left. That was the final straw for Dad, and he legally separated from my mom, and eventually divorced Mom. Mom didn't get the house like she was planning. My folks sold it and split the value right down the middle. I wanted my independence, make that needed. I had to do things for myself. I spoke with the counselors about emancipation, even spoke to a lawyer, and he said it could get expensive, but it would be better if I could be patient and wait until I was 18, then legally mom can't do anything. Dad couldn't take me in because his place was small and he was having his own problems, but he found a solution. I moved in with my uncle and his husband. Do you ever have a life event that changed everything? Moving in with them did. With their help, I realized who I was, that it was okay to be me. I came out to my friends, my family, my school. Mom freaked and screamed. For my 18th birthday, my friends threw me a coming out party. Dad and I had a really long talk because he blamed Mom for me not trusting him sooner. I'm a scrapper, that's what my dad always said, because I used to get in a lot of fights. He thought fighting was my way to prove myself, because I secretly was ashamed of myself. Maybe he was right, maybe not, but I love boxing. Back to senior year. Because of my schedule, for my last semester, I got stuck with a lame crafts class just so I could graduate. Guess who else needed an art credit? Paul. Guess who was with us in that class? Several cheerleaders and a couple of basketball jocks and a chronic sluffer and others. I wasn't the only person with credit issues. Though I knew who Paul was, he didn't recognize me. I'd changed during all those years. Boxing, lifting weights, low-carb eating program, intense cardio. Those things have a way of changing your body and your face, but not my hair. It was still red. Not to mention I also had a black eye, which I had graciously received from my bout last weekend. Anybody who tells you that boxing gloves don't leave bruises is either lying or has never boxed. The teacher tapped the whiteboard a couple of times, and we all took our seats. He had all the desks set into a large rectangular square pattern facing some kind of low-rise podium with a table on it. The table held a pumpkin, a small artist dummy, an old bicycle wheel, two bananas, and an old leather left boot that must have come from the 1920s. 
The chronic sluffer and I sat next to each other. Neither one of us fit in with the prissy jock crowd. I bet I could outrun them, outlift them, and outfight them any day of the week. The sluffer could outhide anybody in the administration. Or the school. We got along fine. After the teacher gave us the class requirements, basically saying that a C was good enough to get credit and graduate, he passed out a silent roll, giving it to the jocks first, and then us, and we each checked off our names. I scribbled mine out and wrote red next to it. I checked the names and confirmed. Yep, my old friend, Paul Castillas, was here. Our teacher passed out 18-inch by 12-inch paper to all of us, starting with the jocks, of course, and some artist pencils, and had us draw the objects on the table. This was a crafts class, so why would we be drawing? Forget the objects on the table. I drew a boxing ring with guys inside boxing. Art is not for me. Each class was an hour and a half long. This was going to be a long semester. The jocks and cheerleaders stayed on their side of the room, and those of us who were in a little bit of trouble stayed on our side of the room. Sometime during the second week, Paul glanced at me and glanced at me again. His mouth opened a fraction. I pretended not to notice. Everybody knew I was gay, called me red, and that I seriously boxed, and that I didn't take crap from anyone. People left me alone. The black eye had faded away, but I did boast a split lip. That was from yesterday's practice bout with my uncle. Did I mention that they liked to box too? Red, why is he looking at you? The chronic sluffer asked. So obvious, one of the girls whispered. She was several months pregnant and had understandable attendance issues. Somebody is making somebody thirsty. Of course, I said, letting my sarcasm out. I'm the cutest guy in the class. In a completely brutal, bloodthirsty way, the chronic sluffer said, and we fist bumped. I suspected the real reason Paul stared. He had just realized that the gay boxer nobody messed with was a friend from a long time ago. Paul whispered something to one of his friends, who looked at me and whispered something back. Then Paul got out of his seat and talked to the teacher. The teacher looked over at me and said something, and Paul nodded, also looking at me. I looked at him, smiled a little, and shrugged. Paul walked over to me and said, Red, are you Emmy? I mean, Emmanuel Todd? You caught me, I said. The girl said, Ooh, true love at last. Paul sort of smiled and said, I'll buy you a drink. Let's go talk. Red, the sluffer said, Back stairway by the kitchens isn't on the security net. They won't catch you until classes change. And if you hit the Coke machine just under the coin return, it gives you a free drink. Really? the girl said. What else do you know? Not far from the crafts room is the back stairway and a collection of vending machines. The sluffer was right about the Coke machine, so we had free drinks, and Paul bought a couple of Snickers and gave me one before saying, Do you remember me? We hung out for a couple of weeks, way back when, and then you beat up a couple of bullies who were bothering me. I know it's been several years, but I've been hoping to find you. You look so different. Yep, I said. Those were good times. Tell me about yourself, Vegas. Paul paused, unwrapped his candy bar, and broke a piece off. He stared at it and said, I hated my mom when she made me transfer schools. Didn't speak to her for weeks. I loved hanging with you and the guys, and I never got a chance to say thank you for standing up for me. You're welcome, I said. Did you get in trouble, he asked. I took a drink of my Coke before I said, nothing bad. I think that moment I began to crush on him. Though we never sat next to each other in crafts class, when we took a break, we often went to the vending machines and talked. About a month after we reconnected, one of the cheerleaders, Belle, loudly whispered to him so we could all hear her. You know he's gay, right? And he always stinks like a locker room. He's not one of us. Daddy says he's one of those lower class, not going to college, stupid kids. What college are you going to? Paul answered. I'm going to be a pampered housewife so I don't have to go to college, she said. I just have to look good. 
In other words, a spoiled and lazy, sit-on-your-butt-complaining-all-day kind of wife who constantly does her nails, one of the other football jocks said. Oh, look, I can't wait to marry a leech like you. And then he mimicked her. Oh, God, I just broke a nail. She flipped him off and said, But I'm Paul's girlfriend, and you don't matter. Paul rolled his eyes and said, Don't have time for a girlfriend. At break, Paul and I talked about colleges. We used our phones and looked up a lot of stuff, including colleges with boxing programs. Paul wanted to go back to Vegas because his dad lived there, and he'd heard good things about the University of Nevada communications program. Paul wanted to go into advertising. They also had one of the top-rated boxing programs in the country. Let's get together Saturday at my place, order pizza, and fill out the applications, he said. It's Mom's book club, so we just stay out of the way and she won't care. Let's go to my place, I said. My uncle and his husband won't mind. When we get done, we could stream videos. My uncle subscribed to Netflix, Paramount, Amazon, and a couple of others. It was only after Paul smiled that I realized that Paul had kind of swindled the college application process into a date. Was he gay? Was he interested in me? No, that's just my hormones wishing it was true. Paul was a friend and nothing more. Our lives went a little weird. About a month before graduation, we learned that Paul was accepted, and I wasn't. It seemed so unfair, but he was the star quarterback. He had the grades for a scholarship, and his dad lived in Vegas, so Paul could claim residency. I sucked in my disappointment, and two months after graduation, when both of us were 18, I went to see Paul the day before he left for Vegas. I'd made him something. Paul sat in their living room, drinking soda, as we talked. What did you give me? he asked. I made it. Open it, I said, no longer afraid to hide the smile. No, Belle said, barging through the open front door. Open my first, because I'm your girlfriend. I bought it with love. It was the cheerleader from crafts class. Her constant jabbering drowned out any conversation. Her present was a heavy, Cuban, flat-link, sterling silver necklace. It was worth more than my gift. I'd made a small scrapbook with pictures from all Paul's games, plus a few ancient ones from when we were kids back in middle school. I guess I learned something from crafts class after all. Let me put it on you, Belle demanded. And then we'll take a selfie together and post it. My friends will be so jealous. Isn't it great I got accepted in Vegas, too? We'll be together. My mom won't let me live with a guy yet, but we don't have to tell her. How close were they? He'd never talked about her because everybody knew I was gay, and he probably didn't want to make me feel uncomfortable. Reality check. The bolt of lightning struck me right in the middle of my gut. I wanted to throw up. I was definitely uncomfortable. I sat on their couch for another ten minutes, listening to her mindless nonsense, holding my carefully wrapped present and feeling sorry for myself. Why did I even come? Because of the memories. Because I had a crush. He was captain of the football team who led us into the championships. He had the looks, and he was one of the most popular kids in school. He had grades good enough for a full-ride scholarship anywhere he wanted. His folks had money. Who am I? An old, almost forgotten friend from years ago who doesn't get sparkling grades and always had minor injuries from boxing. And old clothes because the yogurt shop barely paid anything. As painful as it was, I had to accept that my feelings for Paul were nothing more than a high school crush. I had fallen in love with him, but he didn't see me the same way I saw him. We talked and texted every day, hung out at the mall on weekends, hung out and did homework, occasionally went to a movie or streamed something. We were only friends. Good friends. But the moment he started college in Las Vegas, 2,700 miles away, his life would restart. In no time, he would have a new set of friends, and then he would try out for the football team and make more friends, get more popular. He would forget about me. My life would stay the same while Paul would become the next college champion quarterback. I stood, realizing that this goodbye would be the last time I'd see him. Paul had an amazing life ahead of him, and it was time to let him live it. Leaving my present on the coffee table, I faked a casual smile and said, I need to get going. My present is on the coffee table, so take a look at it when you get a minute. Good luck in Vegas, 
Vegas. His mom walked in with a plate of cookies and a friendly smile and said, Leaving so soon? For a second, I wondered if she regretted sending Paul to another school all those years ago. Did she even remember the red-haired kid that fought off the bullies? Unless Paul had said something to her. Doubtful. Boss wanted me to cover for someone, so I have to go. I lied, by telling the truth. I had a whole hour before he expected me to show up. She must have caught my glance towards Paul and the cheerleader, because her smile seemed to flicker, and then it was back. Take a couple of cookies for the road, she said, and shoved a half dozen in my hand. I'll see you around, I said. As soon as I left their house, my fake smile vanished. I wanted to cry, to scream, to pout. But I wasn't a kid anymore. I'd had my share of hard knocks, and fists weren't the answer. It would take a while, but I'd survive this too. I took a bite of one of the cookies. Dark, bitter chocolate chunk with a bit of cinnamon and not too sweet. Sounds like my love life. Red, hold up, a voice yelled from the house. I turned to see who it was. Paul, holding my present in one hand, had burst out the front door and was running for me. Wait a second, Paul yelled. The first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing the sterling silver necklace. The second thing I noticed was the triumphant grin on Paul's mom's face. The third thing I noticed was the cheerleader's expression of horror as she held the dangling necklace. The fourth thing I noticed was Paul's breathless grin. I wanted to give you something before I left, he said. You don't have to give me anything, I said. He stood shyly close and held out the book I'd carefully stitched together with all the pictures I'd taken over the years. This is really nice, he said. It's just something I made that I thought you'd like, I said. Catching his breath, he shyly looked at the ground, then directly into my eyes and said, I should have said something sooner, but I'm a coward. What did you want to give me? I asked. This, he said, and shyly, timidly, gently, kissed me. On the lips. Oh my God. The first thing I noticed was the intense blush that covered his face. The second thing I noticed was the intense way my heartbeat exploded into a speed techno rhythm. The third thing I noticed was the intense way he looked at me, almost pleading. The fourth thing I noticed was the intense way time stopped. Only the two of us existed. I placed my hand on the back of his neck and drew him closer, until we kissed. As kisses go, it was little more than pressing our lips together. But, as kisses go, it was the most exciting thing that ever happened to me. Something changed between us. Instantly. You ever have one of those moments when you say something totally unexpected, but it turns out to be the truth, like your subconscious was trying to tell you something? That happened right then when I said, Paul, I love you. Heat immediately flushed my cheeks, and Paul sort of smiled, but he was blushing. Remember, his mom was watching, and his girlfriend. Turns out, his girlfriend was only a girlfriend in her mind only. Turns out, Paul had other ideas about who to fall in love with. In the background, I vaguely remember Belle yelling, But I'm following you to Vegas. We're supposed to live together. I'd made all these plans. Stop kissing this Neanderthal. The next day he left for Vegas, and for a year we only saw each other at Christmas and the occasional weekend. However, we texted and called daily. Because I missed him, I threw myself into boxing, and I became the lightweight champion of Rhode Island. A few months later, I reapplied for the University of Nevada spring semester, and they wanted me in their boxing program. I was accepted. Instead of flying to Vegas, I spent a few days driving. Paul knew I was on my way. I called him from every city or town to let him know where I was. When I got to Vegas, they had a busted water main and had shut down a couple of main roads. My maps app got confused with the detours. I got lost. I parked at some place called Gordon's Gourmet Burgers and texted Paul where I was. I guess everybody in Vegas knows Gordon's, and it only took 20 minutes before he arrived. I'd known Paul for years, but when I saw him, I realized how much I loved him. Paul wasn't a kid any longer. He had grown up. He was on the football team as a backup quarterback 
with the potential to become the main quarterback when he became a senior. He was muscular, but not bodybuilder muscled. Lean and strong and quick on his feet, his hug was all I needed to make the trip worthwhile. By that time we were both twenty, eight years after I had saved him from the bullies of middle school. We've lived together ever since. And let me clear up a rumor. Some people have suggested that I proposed and told Paul that if he didn't say yes, I'd beat the crap out of him. It didn't happen that way at all. Paul invited me out to the center of the football field and proposed. Let me finish by saying I love this man and publicly promise to treat him to the best waffles for the rest of my life. I looked at the crowd, then down at my new husband as the caterers served our wedding brunch. Eggs, bacon, sausage, low-carb waffles topped with whipped cream and shaved dark chocolate. And for the carb lovers, cinnamon rolls and regular waffles with maple syrup. Paul stood up, and in front of everyone, he wiped whipped cream on my nose and then kissed it off. Great toast and great speech, Paul said. Paul and I were married not even 90 minutes ago, and this was my speech at our wedding brunch. While everyone talked, I whispered to my new husband, Guess where I'm putting the whipped cream later. I love it when my husband blushes. The end. Thank you everybody for being here. I hope you enjoyed my experimental, low drama, slice of life story. I'm Gio, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Peace.